Tonight's ride, The Mystery of the Blue-Eyed Man. August 12th. It still seems unreal. Here I am, in the middle of three million people, sitting on the window ledge of my own apartment over this pawn shop on Church Street. Well, me and 16 pigeons. Two weeks ago, I was in Big River. Population 2,050. One less now. But finally, it was easy, more or less. All you have to do is leave. <sighs> on the road... A novel to write, places to see. Toronto is just my first stop. <laughs> Some first stop. I mean, that's why I'm out here, to see the world, to experience everything, but I didn't think it would get so weird so fast. So, uh, you driven before? Yeah. Where? Um, Big River. Where? Um, it's near Thunder Bay. Yeah? Big River, what the hell's that? It's like a town. Well, this is like a city. You understand the difference? Yes, sir. I'm desperate. You're hired. I guess I should have told Mr. Piatelli that it wasn't really a taxi cab I'd driven in Big River. It was a forklift out at the lumber yard. But I needed a job. I mean, I really needed a job. When I first arrived, I had $800 in my pocket. I thought I was rich. One day later, it was almost all gone. On first and last month's rent. It's all yours, son. Thanks. Uh, Tail lights out on the left side. Sometimes it stalls for no reason. Okay? Okay. Uh, Mr. Piatelli, he says you're a recent immigrant, too. <laughs> well, I guess. So, we'll see. Uh, oh, uh, Martha, my wife, she's a great cook. You will come over for supper one night. Well, sure. Thanks. That was the first time I saw Jacob Koronsky. Tall and thin, stooped a little, blonde hair thinning, tired looking, but something, what's the word, patricianal about him, too. I was to see him one more time. Uh, new boy. New boy, come in. Hi. Uh, what's your name, so I can write it down, at least? Walker. Um, Devereaux. What kind of name is that? Oh, French and English. <laughs> My mother wanted equal time, I guess. Like, Walker is her family name? Oh, yeah? So what do they call you for short? Walker. Okay. Uh, what's your cabbie's license number? Pardon? Come on. Uh, do you have a cabbie's license? No. Of course you don't. And Alfonso didn't ask to see it, did he? No. Of course he didn't. And you know why? Because Alfonso Piatelli is the most pathetic person in the world. Okay, I'll book you in for your test. I'll try to get you in this week. It's not hard. At least you speak English. So where are you? My first fare turned out to be this very short little old lady dressed all in black, standing in front of an all-night supermarket. At first I thought she was a little kid, surrounded by... Three bags of groceries, except it was almost one o'clock in the morning. Did you call a cab? The old lady looked at me sharply for a moment, her face thin and white under her black head covering. Then she started to pick up the grocery bags. Here, I'll get those bags. Wet night, eh? Four, six, two, Carla. Okay. Uh, whereabouts is that? Four, six, two, Carla. Right. I'll look it up on my map. Good time to go shopping, eh? Not very crowded? Too late. Too late. What? Too late. Um, okay. You stay here out of the rain for a minute. I'll put the groceries in the trunk. Good boy. I walked back to the cab, turned it off. I remember shifting the grocery bags into my left hand, them back to the trunk, opening it, and putting the groceries in. Two of the bags landed on his chest. The other one landed right on his face. Oh, God. What is it? Boy. It's, um... Uh, d d don't come here, lady. D don't come here. But she did. She sloshed across the puddles and looked in. He was looking back up at us from around the groceries. I knew he was dead right away because he looked just like every dead guy I'd ever seen in a movie. 
his mouth open in a kind of silent scream, his head pushed over at a funny angle, and his eyes, pale blue like glass, were staring straight up at us. Too late. Too late. Too late. Uh, I think she meant, like, she should have been home safe in bed or something. Ah. Uh. So, <clears throat> Walker Devereaux. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is a puzzle. Three drivers. Alfonso Piatelli, Jacob Karansky, and you. Now, how long have you been driving, cab walker? About an hour. Tough luck, huh? Yeah. How strong are you, walker? Oh, I don't know. You strong enough to break a man's neck? <laughs> I've never tried. I mean, it wasn't me. It wasn't. How old are you? Nineteen. Nineteen. God, <laughs> what I'd give to be 19. I've just, like, arrived in Toronto about two weeks ago from Big River. That's up near Thunder Bay. I'm just, like, on the road. I, I want to be a writer like Jack Kerouac or Salinger or, like, I'm into the 50s, you know. Why? I guess because all the writers I like, they just seem to be before the 60s. Maybe that's not a good thing? Well, it's not a bad thing. No. Now, this is a bad thing. Stiffs and trunks are nasty, Walker. Right. Now, here's what I've got so far. <clears throat> Joe Smart, who works at Piatelli's cab company, checked the air and the tires, including the spare in the trunk, before Piatelli took it out this morning. Nobody in the trunk. Piatelli drives the cab, then he hands it over to Jacob Karansky, who hands it over to you. <laughs> The three drivers swear they have either been in the cab or within sight of the cab all the time. No one has seen anything suspicious. So, how does the body get into the trunk of the cab? I don't know. Okay, let's suppose, suppose, one of you is forgetful. That the cab was left alone for a short while. Somebody went in for a coffee. Piatelli paid a visit to his bookie, right? But there isn't any sign of forced entry into the trunk. I know Jimmy Marks can't get at it from inside the cab. There's nothing. Two sets of keys. One stays with the car. The other one's in Piatelli's office. Maybe somebody got that key or maybe a duplicate. Maybe they picked the lock. Yeah, maybe. But uh, it's kind of hard to hold a stiff under one arm and pick a lock. Especially, you know, in public. But the question is, the bigger question, is why, hmm? Why would anyone dump a corpse in the trunk of a cab anyway, I, if they want to hide it? Seems to me there must be at least a thousand better places. No. No, I think... I think this is what happened. You, or Karansky, or Piatelli, had an altercation with this guy. I, you it, killed him, panicked, stuck him in the trunk until you could think of something better to do. Uh -huh. Do it, son. No. If I did, why would I open the trunk? Well, you wouldn't. Unless you were very, very smart. Inspector Kiss led me down a long, narrow hall to another room where Jacob Karansky and Mr. Piatelli were already waiting. Mr. Piatelli was smoking a cigarette underneath the thank you for not smoking sign. Jacob Karansky was standing in the middle of the room, his tall, thin frame motionless. His eyes half closed. Hello, Mr. Kronsky? Uh, oh, uh, hello there. Um, Walker. Walker, yes. Uh, how are you holding up? Oh, okay. Good. You're strong? <laughs> yes. Oh, well, that's good. Strength. Right. Okay, gentlemen, if I could have your attention for just a moment. On this table, you'll see the few items that forensics found in the trunk of the car. Now, before they take them away again, I'd like you to have a look at them, just in case. They might mean something, like a clue. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Piatelli. Alfonso, hey, you know me. Yeah, I know you, Alfonso. Okay. One yellow golf tee. Who golfs? I never golf. It's not mine. A baggage ticket, Air Canada. Rusty safety pin. The murder weapon. Well, sorry, I can't help it. I get giddy. I get giddy when I'm under pressure. Not that I'm under any pressure, you understand. Book of matches. 
78 cents and change. Woman's comb, brown plastic. Two staples, cardboard attached. Uh, any bells, gentlemen? No. So who is the guy? What did he have on him? Well, that's the problem. Nothing. No ID, no money, not even any distinguishing marks. Side of broken neck, you mean? <laughs> right. I was really tired by the time I got back to my place, climbed up the three flights of stairs, unlocked the two doors, and put on my Sonny Boy Williamson tape. My debut as a cab driver had not been an auspicious one. I was tired. But everything kept whirling around in my head. So I listened to Sonny Boy, drank a quart of milk, and watched the moon sail above the church across the street. Three drivers, two sets of keys, the old lady opening the trunk, rain, blue eyes. What were those things? Matchbook, golf tee, comb, staples, cardboard attached. And then I went to sleep. either, Mrs. Koronsky. It, it's just like um, me. He's afraid. The police. What about the police? Could you meet me somewhere? I thought you'd be older. Nope. I recognize you right away, like you said. You're... And I'm famous Red Berry. Yes. I would have noticed her right away anyway. Blonde, like Mr. Koronsky, slim, a strong, watchful face. She had a sweater coat wrapped around her as if she were cold, her eyes puffy now, swollen from crying. Thank you so much for coming here. Oh, that's all right. I just don't know what I can do. I don't know either. I just know that I must do something. And you were the last person you were in the cab when that body was found, isn't that right? Yes. I'm hoping that you can remember something. You saw something that will lead the police away from Jacob. Mr. Devereaux, I I'll tell you why, if you promise not to tell us all. All right. Jacob... He has no papers. He's in this country illegally. That's why he is so afraid. That's why he runs. He's afraid the police will find out and deport him. Do you uh, see yes, now? Yes, yes, I see now. But Mrs. Kronsky, if he runs, if he tries to disappear, won't the police be even more suspicious? I mean, they'll be looking for him for murder. Sue, not... Sue, Sue. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. We have no friends. We move here, we move there, always on the move. I have no one to turn to, just you, Mr. Tevero. I'm not asking you to lie to the police. I'm just asking you to think. Think. They arrest the right people and they forget about Jacob. But I told them all I know. I don't know anything. Anything. Really? Mrs. Koronsky looked at me for a long moment, then nodded and smiled. Her eyes filled with tears. I felt awful. Hello? Anybody in here? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, Mr. Piatelli said you were in here. 
I'm Walker Devereaux. The new boy? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Wow, you really know how to start off a job in a big way, new boy. Walker. Bet the name's Walker. Krista Papadopoulos. Nice to meet you, Krista. That was awful, though, eh? Last night? Yeah. Alfonso's kind of out of his mind today. I mean, even more so than usual. He said you all had to go and look at the body. And you found it. Yeah. God. So, like, what did it look like? Was the tongue swollen? Were the eyes, like, you know, bulging out? Jeez, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I was just wondering. Um, Krista? You, you know those trip sheet things we have to fill out after every fair time and place, how many passengers, destination, all that? And sign it and give it to me after your shift, which you didn't do, yeah? <laughs> um, do you think it would be possible for me to, like, see Jacob Koronsky's? Walker, are you playing detective? Sort of. Well, you can't. Some cop, uh, Inspector Kiss. Yeah. He came and he picked up all the trip sheets this morning. Oh, jeez. But he took the originals. I have photocopies. Oh, great. Yeah. So you tell me what you're up to, and I'll get them. Get them, and I'll tell you what I'm up to. Okay. So, uh, are you surprised? About what? About me in a wheelchair. No. Oh. You mean you expected to see me in a wheelchair? No. Well, make up your mind, Walker. There's a lot of strange people in Toronto. Krista Papadopoulos is one of them. But, uh, I don't know. I liked her right away. Something about how she looks up at you and dares you to put one over on her, dares you to a fight almost. And at the same time, she's sort of like, really warm? I don't know. Anyway, I told her. I mean, I didn't tell her about Mrs. Koronsky and her husband and all that. I told her about how I'd been going over everything in my mind, looking for any little thing at all. Three drivers, two keys, locked trunk, and then all of a sudden I had the answer. Like it was obvious. <clears throat> so where are you going, man? Um, 622 Eastern Avenue. Oh, you don't want to go there, man? Why not? Because I don't know where that is. <laughs> really? <laughs> I look it up on my map. It'll be cool. You know, I think half the cabbies in Toronto don't know where they're going. <laughs> you got that right, man. Where are you from? Not here. You say Toronto. No, I'm, I'm not from here. Well, I'm from here now, though. Toronto. Until I move. I figured that it would have taken three men, so I looked for a three-passenger fare on Koronsky's trip sheet with Krista Papadopoulos peering over my arm. It wasn't hard to find. He'd picked up three passengers at 622 Eastern Avenue and taken them to 1523 St. Clair Avenue West. I went there first. It was cheaper. I could go out St. Clair Avenue on a streetcar. 1523 turned out to be a store, Angelo's Body Shop. I peered through the dusty front windows, saw a universal gym and some weights leaning up against the wall. It was closed. A row of shiny garbage bags. One of the bags was larger than the rest. Orange, the kind you use for picking up leaves. It was like a kid's game. Which item does not belong in this drawing? I looked around. I knew what was inside even before I opened it. A large cardboard box folded in two and stamped flat. It was still sealed on top with heavy tape, but underneath it was open. A few large staples still clung to the cardboard. See you around. Thanks. Yeah. Good luck, man. And now I had backtracked to 622 Eastern Avenue, where Karonsky had picked up the three passengers and a large cardboard box the day before. I watched the cab disappear in the dark and then turned towards the house. It was narrow and old and run down, squeezed between a factory wall on one side and a chain-link fence on the other. No lights on in the windows. It looked abandoned. What was I doing here? I could be safe in my room, writing my novel, listening to Sonny Boy Williamson. I could be in Big River. The air smelled heavy and thick, like warm bread. And I thought I could smell the lake out there somewhere, too, something more acid and colder under the warm bread smell. 
door into the wooden front porch was locked. I don't really know what I thought I was going to do. Look in a window, I guess. See something, anything, even just three suspicious-looking men, and then call the cops. But now, if there was no one there, I could just go home. And then I thought of Mrs. Koronsky, of Marta, sitting in that donut shop, her eyes swollen. Hello? Hello? The basement window swung a little on its hinges. A cold, musty smell. Pitch black. Silence. I crawled in as quietly as I could. small yellow circle in the dark. Shadows seemed to jump and dance at the edge of it. I could see a rusty old bed spring propped up against a metal post, a tangle of cardboard boxes, a glimpse of the stairs to the first floor, and something wavering in the dark just outside the flame. Some darker darkness just there. I moved towards it, stretching out the lighter as far as I could reach, and then I heard... Right above my head on the floor above, someone was moving across the floor. I let the flame go out and froze. I couldn't see a thing, but I knew someone was standing at the top of the basement stairs. I moved silently forward, trying to remember where the steps were to get underneath them before he came down. My hand touched a wooden step. I slowly eased under the stairs and then stopped. Because I knew that someone... Someone was under the stairs, too, right behind me. You want another coffee? No, thanks. How's your head? Hurt much? Uh, well, I'm sorry, kid, but how was I supposed to know who you were? Who is it that hit me? You or your partner? Well... I did, but it was a mistake. Yeah. On your part, leave police work to the police. What were you doing in there, anyway? Just checking on all affairs on Piatelli's trip sheet. Crosby's trip sheet. It's typical police donkey work. More to the point, what were you doing in there? Just looking for anything, some clue. I was trying to help Mrs. Karonsky. I don't think her husband had anything to do with it. Oh, you don't? Oh, gee, that's nice. Uh, how do you figure? All of it? You mean the whole thing? The whole thing? Well, if neither I nor Mr. Piatelli nor Mr. Koronsky put that body in the trunk, it had to be a fair. But like you say, it's embarrassing carrying a dead person around in public. But remember the staples with the bits of cardboard on them? Uh -huh. What if the body was in a cardboard box? Mr. Koronsky pulls up. Three men, because you'd need three men, are standing in front of 622 Eastern Avenue. The one guy chats to Mr. Koronsky while the other two heft a heavy cardboard box into the trunk. They arrive at their destination, a bodybuilding club. Mr. Koronsky opens the trunk. The one guy diverts Koronsky's attention to pay the fare, whatever. The other two lift out the box, opening the bottom of it, leaving the body behind, and slam down the trunk. And all Mr. Koronsky sees is the two men still carrying what looks like a heavy carton of weight equipment towards the store. Koronsky drives away. Right. Uh, he drives away. Mm-hmm. Yes, I can run a cup of coffee, please. There's an old dumpster behind the store. I, I put this cardboard box I found in it for safekeeping. I bet there's fibers and hair and stuff caught on it. You do, huh? Where, <clears throat> where'd you say you came from? Big River. Big River. Hmm. Yeah, okay, well, uh, one more. One more question. Why? I don't know. Well, thank God for that. But I think, though I'm afraid, it does have something to do with Mr. Koronsky. They, they must have known who was driving the cab. They did it to Freeman or something. 
Yeah. Well, we may never find out. Why? Jacob Karansky. They found him about two hours ago under the Gerard Street Bridge. He hung himself. A letter. Yeah. Inspector Kiss let me know since he said, well, he said he liked me. Uh, he did? Yeah. Anyway, I guess Mr. Karonsky had written and mailed a letter to his wife the night he disappeared. She didn't know much about him at all. She knew he was from Eastern Europe. She didn't know he had held a high position there, that he had turned against the government, plotted their overthrow, been exposed, and had to flee the country. Oh, but it's changed there, hasn't it? Well, not in his country, not according to Mr. Karonsky. Just the same old faces playing a new tune. They wanted him back. He had certain information about other subversives that was crucial to them. But they couldn't risk a kidnapping, you see. After all, there's supposed to be some kind of socialist democracy now. Anyway, the man in the trunk was a compatriot of Karonsky's, a young lieutenant who had fled the country with him. His death was meant as an invitation for Mr. Karonsky to go back home peacefully. He knew the next invitation would be the body of his wife. Uh, those three men? Well, they're long gone, of course. I phoned her, just to say, you know, I was sorry and everything. She said they were trying to force Jacob into making a decision. The decision he made was the only one they hadn't thought of. You feel bad, Walker? Well, she was so nice, Mrs. Karonsky. <laughs> he was okay, too. Yeah, Jacob was real nice. It's crazy, eh? Yeah. Welcome to the big city, Walker. <laughs>